Hello, this is Uber Archangel. I'm going over overclocking and heat dissipation, heat sinks, fans, CPU pace, and power supply. What we have here is your generic motherboard. As you can see, there's a white outline around each, both the north bridge and the CPU. That is where your retention bracket and also your CPU cooler is going to be, is <clears throat> within the space along within the north bridge. If you can see the RAM, there's very little slot and very little space in between the slots to have heat dissipation, which creates a major issue when you're trying to cool the RAM. Along with the fact if you add a heat sink in the middle, you're, you're looking at next to nothing for room. Unless you have air blowing down on it, you're not going to dissipate any heat, making it utterly worthless. If you look at the north bridge, the north bridge is actually basically the same as a CPU except it's a little bit bigger and it controls your voltages, your sound, your video, that kind of stuff. You can up the voltage on this. Most of the time the heat sinks are kind of crappy for it and they normally put cheap thermal paste on it so think about replacing them or adding a fan or whatever. But that, that covers the motherboard for the most part. Right here we have four, we have three CPUs and we're going to go over thermal paste and different kinds of CPU cooling, lapping and what they are, what they mean. Right here we have the really really cheap version of cooling your CPU which is actually a pad looks absolutely horrible and it is. It doesn't cool very well at all and creates major issues and can actually melt and stick to things. Not very good. Um, the other option they have is aluminum tape also not good, very bad idea, and also conductive. We have Arctic Silver and Cream Ake. These are the two different types of thermal paste I actually use. Cream Ake is good for RAM. It's silicone based. It's non-conductive. It's not going to pull electricity through the thermal paste onto other components. Arctic Silver will, but if you're just putting it on the CPU, it's not going to create a major issue. What we have here is a CPU with the heat sink still on from the factory and with the heat sink off from the factory. The differences are underneath of here there is a thermal paste in between this heat sink and the actual chip like there is here. That will not necessarily be the best thermal paste in there. But if you go to try to pry that off you're going to break your chip in half. Even if you do it right there's a 90 percent chance you're probably going to break something making your chip that you just bought utterly worthless and not really good for anything other than a paperweight or a keychain now what lapping is is if you take a CPU like this and you take and grind this flat because whether you can see it or not there's actually little divots there's also normally a little bit of a ravine to it and that doesn't work out very well and it also decreases the thermal paste's ability to conduct heat properly. Now, you can lap it, but you also got to realize as you're lapping it, you're generating heat. You could also generate static electricity and fry the CPU, making it worthless, once again, a keychain. Not worth it in my opinion, but it can be done. And when you do it, there's a whole procedure on it. I'll put up information in the show notes and why I don't prefer to do that. What we have here are several different types of heat sinks. They're all done with different methods in mind when they're actually using them. This is a Northbridge heat sink, therefore you don't need anything real special with it. It just has the normal clips, has crappy thermal paste on the back. Now if you're overclocking, you might want to try upgrading that. What we have here is an original Pentium. It used to have a clip-on fan across here and it would spiral in there. But the fact of the matter is it pushes air out through these fins, which is the way most of the cooling is done now for CPUs, is they push the air down and out against the CPU trying to cool it. What we have here is an old Pentium heatsink that was the second generation after that. Normally have a fan on top, helped cooling a lot. Um, this is actually a old heatsink for Northbridge or for a really really ancient CPU. You can actually cut this in half and use it for RAM but remember if you're going to do that use a cream ache with it so that you don't have electrically conductive thermal paste on there. 
This happens to be an example of a flower type pattern on either end here. That helps with cooling, especially when doing it with fans, because it happens to follow the same airflow that fans normally do. And this is a really good heat sink. Uh, you probably can't see it very well in the frame. I'll try to zoom in and get a, a capture of it later. It actually has little ridges on the actual fins, improving the cooling very much so. Right here is an example of just a cheap heat sink, but it's got a whole lot of surface area. The more surface area, the better the increased cooling you're going to have. But remember, you always have to have airflow flowing across it to increase the cooling to a level that's normal for the CPUs nowadays. And what I have here is an aftermarket GPU cooler. It actually uses heat pipes which run along and are connected to each one of these fins. And they're connected on the back to a, a copper plate that touches against the GPU using your Arctic Silver thermal paste and will cool or heat the pipes and the heat from the pipes dissipates down each pipe equally and then gets cooled by the fins. This model happens to be great for the card it was designed for. I tried using it for a more powerful one, didn't work out so well. So, What I have here is a regular computer case. It's a cheap case, it cost me 50 bucks. Um, the thing is about it, it can beat a $300 case when it comes to cooling. The reason why is I have a fan up top up here that I actually pull the hot air out this way because obviously it's going to be standing out. Hot air rises, common sense would say. Have the a fan up top pull the air out. Then you have this fan on the side. This pushes air directly down on top of the CPU fan, thus making it a very good pulling side panel. And then, of course, if you have a stand up cooler, you will need a fan back on the back and a fan on the actual heatsink, and they both blow out the case because this is the hottest component. You want to get the hot air out of the case, the cool air in the case. This case, 50 bucks, comes with a power supply. I don't understand why people pay $300 for an all aluminum case when my air cooling beats their air cooling in their case. It doesn't make any sense. So when you are getting a case, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for front intake ports. You want to look for a rear 120 millimeter spot to be able to put a fan for exhaust. You want to have a fan that's going to blow air directly down your CPU and you're going to want to have an exhaust fan up top. Most cases don't have this. If you look at the $300 cases, they don't have them. You look at a cheap $50 case, that's when they actually start to have them and it makes common sense to buy the one that's going to have the better coin. So that's why I bought this case. Now we're going to go into components and how close things get when you're putting on aftermarket heat sinks, etc. This happens to be a stock heat sink, but as you can tell, the distance between the north bridge and the CPU is incredibly, incredibly small. It's just enough to fit two wires, not even three wires past. So you, when you're buying an aftermarket heat sink, you have to do the measurements yourself. Make sure the stuff's going to fit when you get it. And as you can see, the heat from this, by this blowing down on this, it blows heat across this way through the grooves, making it so that it'll actually cool the north bridge using the CPU cooler. Most people don't look at that stuff. You have to look at it. If you get one of the ones that stands up and blows this way, you no longer have that air that they planned on having blown across this, so you have to add a fan. These are th simple things that people don't look at when they do cooling and they buy all this aftermarket stuff that looks real nice and fancy. You don't have to get something fancy. Just look at it and think, is this going to work thermally for my computer? As you can see here, this has slightly more space than the regular RAM, so this can actually fit heat sink RAM. Some motherboards, the RAM is so close together that you can't fit heat sinked RAM into your motherboard. Also, if you notice, this has an open spot right here, which is very good because that means you're going to have good cooling on this stick and this stick. And on these, you're going to have the outside cooling, which means the cooling is going to be slightly better on this than on one that has all four slots crammed together. And you're not going to get any cooling that way because you have no airflow. That's another reason why this fan up here is also important because as this pulls down onto this, you're getting cool air 
and then the cool air is getting accelerated even more by this and then it's going to blow over here, it's going to hit your RAM, it's going to cool your RAMs home. So you want to look at that and there's different motherboard layouts. Some of them actually have it so that the RAM is going to be cooled by the CPU fan. If that's true, you have to get something that's going to blow across the, the RAM for cooling if you get a vertical heatsink. Remember, just take a look at everything that goes into the computer and think, is this going to work thermally for the computer? Also, when you're getting into all this stuff, you're going to need a good CPU, as I mentioned, or good power supply, as I mentioned before, multiple times. When you have a good power supply, most of the time they're going to be single rails. Single rail power supplies can create a lot of noise, so you have to make sure you get a high quality one and check the, the hardware reviews to make sure there's not going to be noise on your actual audio channel and it can also interfere with USB connections and all kinds of things. As you've seen in our previous segment, we have the voltages going up and down. With a good power supply, the voltages are going to be more stable than you saw in that BIOS and are not going to sway very much up and back because the more sway you have the more the parts have to try to adjust and too much sway means you could get too much voltage or too little voltage and that can affect your RAM, that can affect your CPU, that can affect your Northbridge, it can affect anything in the computer whether it be hard drive, doesn't matter.